Good afternoon, everybody. Would you please come in and take your seats? Well, welcome to this closing session on our first day. It's been a fascinating day, and I th we're closing now with a keynote by Bjorn Wittrock. I would like to briefly introduce Bjorn and then give him the floor. Bjorn is university professor at Uppsala University in Sweden, and he's the principal of the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Studies in Uppsala. He was Professor of Government at Stockholm University, visiting professor at several well-known universities in North America, including Berkeley and Stanford, and he's been visiting professor in several European universities. Bjorn is an active member of research councils, academies, and institutes for advanced study in several countries, as well as the European Research Council. He has accumulated an extensive list of publications in peer-reviewed journals, chapters in books, and he has written or at least edited 19 books. Of particular interest for us today is his research focus on the history of the social sciences, how the social sciences have interpreted modernity and transformation in modern society. And today, Bjorn will contribute for us to this conference with his keynote titled Social Sciences in Their Context, Five Transformative Periods. Bjorn, thank you for being with us, and I now give you the floor. Thank you so very much, Roderick, for those <laughs> excessively kind words. I should begin by making you very disappointed. This morning, Emmanuel Wallerstein said that in the contestations around open the social sciences, there had been a host of people trying to prove their significance and originality by disagreeing violently. I, I've, I will make you dis deeply disappointed because I'm in, I remember reading the book when it appeared and I was in agreement then and I've reread it and I'm still in agreement. So I will have to come up with something else. <laughs> um, I will say a few words about the context of the book and then I will try to highlight some of the elements of contingency, uncertainty that have accompanied, and discontinuities that have accompanied the development of the social sciences, and that I think also, to some extent, prompted some of the remarks that Emmanuel Wallerstein made this morning, that we should not discuss the situation and the future of the social sciences in a triumphant mode at all. Uh, mm. Now, Open the Social Sciences came at a particular juncture in the development of social science. It came at a period when the social sciences had gone through, well, originally the Trente Glorieuse, the sort of the development in the afterwar period when they were finally consolidated, not only in the European and North American setting, but also in many other parts of the world. During the 1960s, the social scientists had often formed and entered into reform coalitions with politically significant groups, and the social sciences had found a home across the board in the universities in a widely expanded higher education system. In the course of the 70s, and especially after this change of political majorities in Britain and the United States, in 
at the turn from the 70s to the 80s, the situation came, became different. The, the social sciences came under attack from a variety of, of corners, not only well, political, but not only political. And this prompted efforts at assessment, self-assessment, and reconsideration. I can just mention one or two of those. This morning we discussed the transition from the SSRC to the ESRC in the British context. In that connection, there was a, an exercise that ushered in a report called Horizons of the Social Sciences. That was, work was done mostly in 85. And I had the pleasure of being a member of that commission together with Nigel Thrift and David Held and many, not many, but a number of others. And I still don't think the report was so bad. I, I have doubt, serious doubts that it had any real effects. About the same time, there was uh, an exercise launched in the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, uh, re producing a report, or so a 10 year outlook on research opportunities in the social and behavioral sciences. This was a commission chaired by Duncan Luce and Nils Melser. And in the European context, a group of scholars, not least in Berlin, entered into a similar exercise that in 92 led to the book European Social Science in Transition. There were many other efforts that were not so much based in, organiza in the organizational sphere but within the, within the scholarly si research system itself. In the American context at the SSRC there was a committee on states and social structures and Sida Scotchpool, Peter Evans, Dieter Schrieschmer and others played a key role and one result of the work in that commission was a report which traced the interaction of social sciences and policies. The book States, Knowledge and the Origins of Social Policies was published in 1996 by Princeton. And I thought it was an interesting stock taking. I had a little piece in that also, as had Peter Wagner. Uh, we had uh, also important works, for instance, by the historian Dorothy Ross on the origins of American social science, which essentially questioned the Whiggish history writing of a triumphant development of the social sciences. And we had um, um, efforts within the natural science community, for instance, when it comes to global environmental change, to establish a social science component or affiliate to that, that was an initiative taken by the International Social Science at the time. And within the field of social studies of science, there were, there were a couple of, re of yearbooks that had the social sciences at their explicit focus. And we had the whole field of knowledge utilization research with Carol Weiss at Harvard as an inspiring leader that tried to trace the effects of social science research. We also had the book that came out in the early 90s, two years before Open the Social Sciences, by, uh, written by Helga Novotny, Peter Scott, Michael Gibbons, Camille Morsch, Simon Schwarzman, and Martin Trow on the new production of knowledge. So there were a number of, and uh, work also, almost at this time also, started on a third edition of the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences. That came to be called the International Encyclopedia of Social and Behavioral Sciences. But all of these were efforts at stock taking and self reflexivity. But Open the Social Sciences stands out in comparison with all these other, other exercises. And I think there are three characteristics in the report that had this effect. Firstly, it was a well written report, it was brief. And it managed in a remarkable way to combine a narrative with very concrete recommendations. And these recommendations were grounded and specific. So you had, uh, firstly then, a well-written, concisely formulated book that actually gave concise advice, concise recommendations based on the diagnosis. And these Thirdly, these recommendations, they were, they were brief, they were disarmingly simple and pragmatic, that is feasible and they would not need to cost huge amounts of money. They wouldn't, couldn't just be wiped off the table with reference to their unrealistic, uh, completely utopian character. It's also the case that this book, I think, had a vastly larger diffusion, vastly larger impact on discussions than any of the other works that I've quoted. So it is very appropriate that we 
that we recognize the importance of this work and future work in that spirit. Now, I had promised to give an account of the history of the social sciences that would focus on five key periods of transition. I think I have to abstain from that if I'm not going to be cut very short by Roderick. I've tried to do something along those lines in some other context. I think the starting point 20 years ago, as it is now, is a realization within the social science community that the social sciences really are more urgently needed for our understanding of crucial societal problems, problems of human existence, than they have been for a very long time. At the same time, the potentials of the social sciences are really not released, but caught up not in various boundaries and also are not realized because of lack of proper mechanism, proper, proper funding mechanism, not least. But it's, it's so obvious that the global context cannot be made intelligible in any sense without the contributions of the social sciences. Conversely, I would add, this offers immense possibilities for advancement and conceptual innovation in the social sciences and the humanities, both by empirical prob probing and testing on a vastly expanded scale, but also, of course, by the fact that they would f this forces us to rethink some of our basic categories. We should never forget that the social sciences, as we know them today, were institutionalized and conceptually stabilized, consolidated at a period in time when Europe played a more important role in global history than it had ever done before, or important, or was a in a more hegemonic position than it ha had ever been before, and that, that it will never be, had a, has never been afterwards. And that means that despite critique of Eurocentrism, parochialism, despite what Dipesh Chakrabarti tell, teaches us and tells us rightly that we should provincialize Europe, much of the work remains to be done. We have to rethink our basic categories so as to not be still and be paralyzed by critique, but move on to do further research. Uh, this is also the case, of course, that many of those questions that we thought had been settled for a long time is open again, such as what is life? What is the distinction between the human and the non-human? What is the relationship between Europe and other parts of the world? Those are necessarily open to question again. And I think in, if that is going to lead to real advancements in the social science, it, it has to be done with a keen sense of the historical contingency of social sciences and, as Immanuel Wallerstein reminded us this morning, of universities. I mean, there was a real possibility at the turn from the 18th to the 19th century that the university would have been discarded as a superfluous and ancient feudal institution not appropriate for a modern society. And there are scholars today, it's not so many it's years ago that Peter Weingart wrote his famous article, The End of Academic Science, question mark. I don't think this will happen, but if we forget about this fragility and contingency, we are almost bound to make serious mistakes. Now, as I said, Open the Social Sciences proposed a number of, uh, of recommendations, four specific recommendations that were, to my mind, reasonable then and are still very reasonable. But are they, these recommendations sufficient? They have been certainly to the good for the social science community. And if the caterers had been part of us, that they would have done even more good. But the caterers have not been part of us. On the contrary, there have been a long-term development, for instance, both in institutional terms and in policy terms, that in many, many ways has made the situation of the social sciences more problematic. Now, before I go on, I cannot talk about global history in this context. But of course, when we discuss social sciences, we are almost often, almost always, guilty of some kind of Whiggish assumptions. I have, for various reasons that I will not go into, I've, I've been very interested in periods of deep-seated cult cultural crystallization in world history. And I think, for instance, what somewhat, despite the risk of using what it may be appear as a misnomer to some of you, the deb debate about the so-called axial age, that is the profound transformations, both in societal and intellectual terms, in the middle of the first millennium BCE, or BC, uh, that has led to an, was something that happened almost without no 
significant participation of the social science, except some late Weberian scholars, such as Schmuel Eisenstadt and Wolfgang Schluchte and others. But that debate has gone on and was actually one of the first attempts, I'm not uh, parallel in many ways to the, to the work of Emmanuel Wallerstein, to propose a mode of analysis that was not deeply Eurocentric. Um, if you remember the variant sociology that, to my mind, pervades in many ways much of contemporary social science, political science, and economic history, that takes as a starting point, almost always, that something very specific happened in Europe in the 10th to the 13th centuries. A divergence between ecclesiastical and, and political power, the emergence of an urban revolution, growth of cities, growth of commerce, growth of agricultural productivity, contestations about basic assumptions, the creation of new universities, and some people even use the word first scientific revolution. At the same time, as Aristotelian thought is reintroduced into Europe by uh, some nodes, uh, such as Toledo and Sicily, where you have interaction between Arab speakers Hellenistic scholars, Hellenistic trade scholars, and Western Latinists. Now, in these periods of, of deep seated societal transformation, you can witness the fact that, of course, they are not driven by idealistic consumptions. I'm not subscribing to, a deep, to an idealistic theory of history, but you can witness that profound trans changes in production patterns coincides sometimes with the deep-seated societal crisis. And in some cases and in some arenas, there is also literati who reinterpret their own traditions and proposes measures, proposes analyses that draw on their traditions, but also involve definite implications for the way in which you organize society, how you conceive of history, how you conceive of agency and sociality. And in all these cases, if there is a, some measure of autonomy and some efforts to, by literati to work through these ideas in such a setting, they may, just may, influence deeply the way we think about the world. And there is an emerging consensus, actually, among historians that there is a way of thinking about this comparatively. This has not yet influenced, in a deep sense, the way social sciences operate. But you remember Weber in his Vorbemerkung, in his introduction to the three massive volumes on the sociology of religion, he says that so, uh, not only that administration, bureaucracy, but also science, as we like to believe, as he formulates it, has only emerged in Europe. That was a reasonable position at the turn, or one possible position, in the beginning of the 20th century. It is no, it's hardly any longer an, a possible position to take. Echoes of Weber's position echoed even as far as Needham science and civilization in China. It is, it is not defensible to my mind today if you talk to the leading sinologists and leading historians of science. That means that a number of our basic categories, even discussion, discussing the phenomenon that we have on the table today, would in a sense require a degree of historical reflection that I, I have not performed it, but I'm working with a number of colleagues and at least taking some preliminary steps. But I will have to, that, to leave that just to the side and use the term social science. And of course, in discussing social science, we must think a little bit about what was before. What was actually this Elendigen Kameralwissenschaft in which Marx talked about? What role did versions of political arithmetic play in the absolutistic states in Europe in the late 18th century? What was the interaction between the development of arithmetic, geometry, and new forms of statistics? This, these types of questions have been analyzed by scholars such as Ian Hacking, Rainy Duston, Eric Briand, and many others. And, and we have a much deeper respect for both the nature of the ruptures and the, the tacit implicit continuities that we have to think about. There is actually now a huge project going on looking at natural law in a long term, how it was actually taught in universities and for how long it lingered on, whereas we see it as some sort of basically a phenomenon that would peter out in the course of the 18th century. I will not go into that, but we must realize, of course, that the social sciences grew out of earlier forms of moral and political philosophy and became something that in the course of the 19th century 
we came to designate social sciences. As we know now, of course, the first recorded use of the term social science dates from the 1790s. So there is a very close interaction between the revolutionary upheavals in the European setting in the late 18th, early 19th century, close links to the coming of industrialism, urbanism, political upheaval, and a cultural, deep-seated cultural shifts, including the emergence of new arenas, a new public sphere, to paraphrase um, Habermas. But of course, when Habermas proposes this, it is a rather Eurocentric conception. I published, together with Mulla Eisenstadt, a work a number of years ago where we had posed the question, what would a public sphere have looked like in Tokugawa, Japan, or in Qing, China? And when we first posed these questions, the, our partners in the history, of course, thought this is a ridiculous question, and then they produced very interesting results. So, uh, and of course, this is a period when, as Emmanuel Wallerstein reminded us this morning, universities suddenly try to play a role, uh, come to play a role. But I mean, that was, that was a contingent development, a new role, where eventually the production of new knowledge in the late, especially in the latter half of the 19th century, becomes important. Well, I will, I will not speak more about it, but I just emphasize this feature. And the similar, similarly, of course, the fragilities and the contestations that occur in the 1890s and 1930s when social sciences acquired a degree of institutionalization in academic and also to some extent in political terms, which they hadn't had before. This has been analyzed by many scholars in the last 70 years, not least from H. Stuart Hughes' huge book on consciousness and society, and despite much criticism, it is still a valuable book. But there is, a kind, there is, I think, now a broad agreement that this is a critical period, but it is a critical period where developments look very different in the European case and in the American case. And the particular form of practices that emerge in the American case have less, have not only, I would be very cautious now, had not only to do with intellectual advancements, but also about characteristics of professionalization and political and economic features in American society that differed from the European case. I have looked at that in a number of other cases, but I think, it, again, it's extremely important that we are cautious and careful and not subscribe to a Whiggish model. And again, when I remember very well when I read Open the Social Sciences when it appeared, that was a time when I was engaged with Peter Wagner and many others in a, pro, in a pro trying to rewrite the history of the social sciences. And when you had read the disciplinary specific histories, they were overwhelmingly written in a Whiggish, in a Whiggish tone. And uh, that was, was an enormously refreshing experience to read a brief, concise account like that of Open the Social Sciences that did not, that gave a realistic account of the interaction of societal, economic, political, and intellectual developments. In other contexts, I have focused specifically on the interwar period, which I think is an enormously interesting period when some promising developments are cut short, others, not least what we now call the Anal School, but, all, but also several, several others uh, were formulated when research programs that came to echo several decades in, um, after the Second World War were formulated. Uh, when, for instance, the first edition also of the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences appeared, an encyclopedia that incidentally was much more historically oriented than the one that came out in 1969, where also we talked about uni unity of science this morning, when the, f when the book series, the International Encyclopedia of Unified Science was formulated, was launched from within the circles of logical empiricists, but it came when it and it lasted for 35 years, from I think 1934 to 1969, and of course saw the publication of books that we now interpret as having provided basic attacks on the basic conceptualizations of positivism, such as Tom Kuhn's book on the, scientific, the structure of scientific revolutions. I have to stop with that if I'm going to end in a reasonable time. Um, but I think, again, that we have underestimated the contingency of this period. It is an absolutely crucial period in the history of social science. However, the full-blown institutionalization of the social science disciplines on a global scale is very largely a phenomenon of the era after the, the Second World War. 
And one manifestation of that was the establishment, of course, of a series of international associations for different social sciences, the International Political Science Association, the International Sociological Association, and several others that overtook and largely replaced an earlier, an, uh, an earlier French model of institut. In the 1960s, there was, of course, a dramatic expansion of higher education systems across Western Europe and North America, but also in many other parts of the world, concomitant to sweeping processes of administrative reform and rationalization efforts. Those are incidentally extremely interesting from a, the point of view of the social sciences. If you think of, I think this has not been analyzed closely enough. Joel Isaac at Cambridge has been hinting at that, but I mean, it's ironic that the whole system of program budgeting and all those rationalistic techniques grew out of a military-oriented think tank, Rand Corporation. But of course, they are related to ideas of linear programming and is a kind of long-term planning, essentially, <laughs> which are very different from those of microeconomics of preference ordering. So you had elements which could, in other set, I mean, you can hear almost lines by Oscar Lange echo in that, though the proponents of it were not always uh, conscious of that. In the wake of this transformation, methods and techniques changed within social science disciplines, and a number of disciplines changed that format very much. This, of course, is linked to the so-called behavioral revolution, which was in many ways an effort to scientize uh, disciplines that, to make them less historical, less narratively oriented, and more quantitative, more formal, more respectable in professional terms. I will come back to that. And of course, this is a period when American social science becomes a dominant model. Now, in the present period, uh, which I think we can think back at least to the time when Open the Social Sciences emerged, we still have a situation of mass higher education that has actually increased. Universities are gateways to the world of modernity on a global scale now. Um, it is, however, also remarkable to what an extent truly innovative research contributions have resulted from work in scholarly setting outside of the structure of regular disciplinary university departments. However, in this period, in the after the Second World War, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the most typical academic creation of this period was the scholarly discipline, gathering associations, journals, denominations of chairs and teaching units, and sometimes research program in one institutional structure that was often loosely knit, but nevertheless provided orientations for research and intellectual exchange. While there were some early formative developments, in particular in the natural sciences of this type already in the late 19th century, it is from the 1960s onwards that we've witnessed the formal, real formation of quantitatively significant disciplines in social science departments across the world. And the basic self-understanding of this period is that science largely should emulate models of the natural sciences. Often there was a lively internal debate in single disciplines, but some disciplines, such as economics, were more strongly oriented at the former, at a much more formalistic model than, say, history and anthropology. Despite such variety, however, the disciplinary structure consolidated in the course of the late 20th century, aided very much by international efforts to generalize this disciplinary model. Now, in recent history, there are, we must observe a number of features that could be perhaps subsumed under the rubric of deep-seated destructuring of key features of the ordering. So we have this, some people have spoken of a transition from a discipline to a problem and user-oriented form of practice. Others have spoken of the end of academic research. In any case, however, nobody can credibly propose recommendations for the future of the social sciences and the amenities without taking a close look at the recent history of these practices. There is a deep-seated shift in the social sciences and in the traditional context of universities in terms of modes of evaluation, distribution of recognition, thematic priorities, and theoretical orientations. Um, now, this is not to argue for uh, any kind of adoption of 
the so-called node one as an ideal. On the contrary, I think there is a need, an acute need, for a degree of intellectual and institutional autonomy, but also a much need, a gr great need for a much stronger encouragement of boundary crossings within these spheres of relative autonomy. And I think that is what was proposed in Open the Social Sciences. Scholars in the social sciences and also in the humanities have perhaps, because of the recent and sometimes precarious position of their scholarly practices, often asserted the disciplinary specificities more strongly than scholars from the natural, medical and technological sciences. However, also in the social sciences and humanities, people are, no matter, even if they had obtained positions and are read, are afraid of having their academic credentials devaluate, devalued too swiftly, leading scholars across many of the social sciences engage in trans disciplinary transgressions in the current period. Now, in the paper I had intended to read, I have looked rather carefully at a number of those transgressions as they apply to the interaction between the social sciences and the humanities and the social science and the natural sciences. Let me just make an observation that I think that the, there are passing reference to the development of the humanities in Open the Social Science, but basically I think you can say that the humanities emerged out of three, a, tri a triad of engagements. One was efforts to somehow construct a genealogy to ancient Greece and to a lesser extent to ancient Rome and argue that modern European societies somehow reflected the basic features, could be legitimate heirs to that heritage of, of the ancients, but that was a heritage that was interpreted in universalistic terms. But at the same time, a second source of, 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 for the development of the humanities was largely the efforts to articulate the needs of the new or the reformed nation states and their particular need for academic disciplines, museums, exhibitions, and so forth. That is the local. And finally, of course, uh, as in anthropology and ethnology, ethnography, the meeting with the other, whether in, this, their own, in the society of the researchers themselves or as part or, can come or parallel to the ongoing processes of imperialism. Now, for a long time, those different strands coexisted in an uneasy way but the developments during the second, during the 20th century, and of course the disasters of the 1930s and 40s, made it virtually impossible to uphold that natural unity and forced to a profound rethinking of the situation of the humanities. And in most countries, after the Second World War, the relative position, both in the public sphere and in institutional terms, of the humanities tended to decline. This has led to a situation when technocratic policymakers for a long time have entered into positions where the university, where the humanities are suffering in relative terms. And of course, we witness now in Japan rather drastic proposals, but in many other countries also. Ironically, this occurs, of course, at the time when finally scholars and human beings at large realize that many of the phenomena that we are witnessing, mass migrations, increasingly globally economic entanglement, are simply not and our relationship to the previous colonial world, the global south, are impossible without the collaboration between social scientists and humanistic scholars. We cannot have a social science that overwhelmingly limits itself to 200 years of a North Atlantic history and where the scholars are not competent to go into archives, work in other parts of the world. There's an urgent need to articulate a new and critically important role for the humanities in the 21st century, but also to provide them resources that allow for meaningful dialogue and interaction. This is, I think, to some extent happening. If you think of work such as Sheldon Pollock's work on the Sanskrit knowledge system on the eve of colonialism, or scholars in the Global South, such as Wang Hui, uh, and lots of scholars in Africa and Latin America, this is happening, and that is leading to also conceptual innovations in the European no longer center, past center. It actually opens up enormously exciting modes of scholarly interaction that we should welcome as social scientists. They are indeed necessary. Similarly, even if 
in the 18th century, before the arrival of even the term social science, there were very close interactions between fields of what we now would call natural science, medicine, and what became the social sciences. Many of you may remember the volume that, of which Robert Wokley was one of the uh, editors called Inventing the Human Sciences that traced some of those intriguing linkages. But in the contemporary world, of course, we see a situation when the natural sciences are entering the world of the social sciences on a vast scale, but on a scale where the social scientists are often conceptually unprepared and historically not very conscious of the implications of that. So we see, for instance, that the long-term development of languages, linguistic families, depend really on collaboration between linguists, historians, archaeologists, geneticists, the whole Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig was built around that, but that is occurring at many other places. Studies of the human mind and the philosophy of mind and consciousness increasingly involved close collaboration between philosophers, psychologists, neurologists, brain researchers, as well as researchers in boundary crossing disciplines such as the cognitive sciences and artificial intelligence. Um, the question, at least previously pr provisionally settled, already at the turn from the 18th to the 19th century, about the boundary between humans and non-humans is being reopened by medical and genetic engineering. In practical this term, terms, this is one of the sources for the rapid growth of the field of bioethics. But that field, of course, bioethics alone, of course, cannot grapple with these problems. Finally, as we have heard throughout this day, virtually all policy oriented studies now demand collaboration between social and human natural and natural scientists. This is glaringly obvious in the case of environmental change. The World Social Science Report 2013 was specifically devoted to that. In the IPCC, which we have discussed, there is now a trickle of scholars from the human and social sciences that actually work with that. Uh, dramatic developments in evolutionary biology once again fill or impinge upon the social sciences in interesting ways, including in sociology and the theory of social mechanisms and analytic sociology, but again, as a hundred years ago, without scholars in this field being at all real conscious of the dangerous implications of that. We should not forget that many peoples across the political spectrum were deeply engaged in, evol in evolutionary, in, in, uh, in uh, eugenics a century ago. There are many works, for instance, Ribas offers on, on the, the revol revolution as society that traces this in detail. And we should really not, I mean, it would be horrible if we were sliding into that trap without reflection and we're sliding into it at all. Now, we know, um, just one more example, I mean, remote sensing, is as natural science as you can get, yet this affects deeply ancient, uh, the writing of history, for instance, the establishment of the Lemus in North Africa. Now, so there is collaboration already going on, but that must be done with a great sense of historical contingency and fragility. I would then finally only say a few words where I think what's happened in the world in the decades after the publication of Open the Social Sciences. So one is that um, we are now facing, I think, a situation when there is collaboration between the social sciences and the humanities. Um, there is increasing interaction between the so different social science disciplines and also bet between social sciences and humanities. Increasingly, we speak of SSH, social sciences, humanities as a, if not coherent, at least an interlinked, inter interlinked field rather than social sciences as opposed to humanities. Secondly, a number of uh, research groups in the social sciences and humanities collaborate, as I've already indicated, with them uh, across disciplinary boundaries. There is also increasing collaboration of this type that will have very important effects for the interaction between European scholars and scholars in the Global South. I can mention, for instance, the close interaction that occurs now between European institutes for advanced study and Indian corresponding institutions. I can point to the development, many of you may have been involved in this in Berlin, I've been involved from the very start and still is on the academic board for that, this so-called Forum for Regional 
studies. This doesn't sound very dramatic, but it is dramatic. It's a large-scale effort to draw on the strong traditions in Oriental languages, in extra-European languages, in a way that is not just repeating the errors of the past. When this was inaugurated, that was actually in the Altus Museum in, in Berlin, very close to the old, now rebuilt Imperial Palace, which will be somehow rethinking Humboldt in contemporary age, and wisely the person invited to be the keynote speaker was Dipesh Chakrabarti, who, of course, knows much more about European intellectual history than most Europeans. And this is an effort that really involves close collaboration with, between scholars in the Global South and in the North. And I would like to mention also that people in the... Well, we were our own collegium was pursuing a program for a number of years linked to efforts in, at the Princeton Institute and in Berlin, but primarily collaborating with institutions very close to Emmanuel Wallerstein, namely the Maison de Sciences de l'Homme and the Centre d'Etudes Mondiales, on trying to rethink economics and its imperial claims in the contemporary age. Um, this work has now, some of the key scholars involved in this work, has now embarked on an effort to look at the social sciences, societal in de developments across the world by launching something which is called IPSP, International Panel on Social Progress, and Olivier Boin and Michel Viviacom, you know very well, are central in this effort. This involves now close to 300 scholars working collaboratively across disciplinary and national boundaries, and the final report will actually be produced this year and will be published in a series of volumes by Cambridge, but also a concise volume spelling out the implications of this. I've already falsely indicated the changing role of the natural sciences. But so there are these efforts which are very inspiring, very interesting, but also demand a lot of attention. But I would argue that even if you can perhaps talk of the SSH as one field, there is, I think, not only an emergent but actually existing tripartite divisioning with this field between between, uh, you could say, historical interpretative modes of analysis, in, and I, even if they are quantitatively underpinned, which I would say includes most of anthropology, sociology, political science, geography, and a number of others. But I think it would be, it would be naive uh, to underestimate the strength of deductive nomological formalistic modes of reasoning drawing on the neoclassical economic theory. There is tr it's, it has been mentioned. I, I was sitting for many years and almost next door to the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee, and one of our permanent fellows is now the only non-economist on the Nobel Prize Committee for the Economics Prize. And of course, they have in recent years given the prize to some people who, are, who are, haven't been accredited economists. And there is the field of behavioral economics and so forth. But I think it would be naive to underestimate the force of economic theorizing and the way in which it impinges on other modes of analysis. And I mentioned, and I very in friendly terms with leading scholars in analytic sociology, but of course it is a mode of analysis very different from the historical interpretive mode that we are reasoning about now. And once it, and it's not only a question of rational choice theory and, and uh, rational choice and social choice, it is much beyond that. And via systems biology, it will influence network analysis also. So this is a field that we have to relate to one way or the other. And I think one also has to realize that these interactions between neurology, medicine, brain research, cognitive science, that now means that you have well-trained early career scholars on a rather significant scale, which operate in modes. They are very nice persons. They do deal with extremely important problems. But it is a different mode that most of us were trained with. Nothing wrong, perhaps, with that. But it is a mode that we have to think through how we, how we relate to. And I think those of us who cherish the notion of the importance of historical comparative research with long durée, we have really to think very carefully how this mode of analysis can be, can be maintained. I think it's crucially important for us and for humanity. Finally, there, are f there were four recommendations in Open the Social Sciences. I won't repeat them. The one on compulsory joint appointments, I think, is an eminently sensible one. It has perhaps to some, but I think to small an extent, been realized. The one on joint work for graduate students is also very sensible. Let me mention 
few examples why we have now gone beyond that. Uh, so we have now actually a development where early career scholars, there are ambitious programs for early career scholars, not only graduate students, not only postdoctorates, there are kind of post-postdoctoral formation that is taking pl place, not least through the effect the efforts of institutes for advanced study but also even more importantly through the emergence of new funding bodies and i think you cannot exaggerate the importance of the f of the working of the erc in this respect and the starting grants and the consolidators are crucial in this respect and also give these early career scholars a degree of autonomy that was not there before it's a an, eff an effective way of defeudalizing european social science and a m much welcome one at that but there are also efforts by some of the institutes. Our institute is working very closely with the Ecole des Autitudes and the Princeton Institute with something called the Summer Program for Social Sciences, where we worked with scholars from the Global South, particularly Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, to give them an experience, but also us ourselves stimulus, and working through a three-year cycle where we try to well, discuss what is social science about today. I cannot go on saying more about that. May I just mention that the IPSP, which I mentioned, is now, of course, entering into a number of global interactions. So one of that is also that in the public sphere, they will now enter in a dialogue with the G20 group, not the G7 group. There are many such things happening. But the situation of early career scholars is very important. The role of institutes for advanced study, I would have liked to say something more. more the integrated research program with the universities are now occurring on actually a much larger scale than was ambitious when Open the Social Sciences was published originally. The, the IPSP is one way of doing that. Key themes in human sciences, which was taking place in the German context some years ago, is another good example. The Kieta Hamburger colleague, the same. There are now university-based uh, efforts on that along those lines on a very large scale. And finally, I would like to say, I would like to quote Helga Novotny when she said at the colloquium in Paris some years ago that we are calling for places that allow for the right mix of intensity and passion. And she argued institutes for advanced study are those places. They do offer a degree of institutional autonomy that is rare. They have a high degree of institutional freedom, and they are breeding zones where genuinely new ideas emerge. I'm not going to speak pro dormo, but I think what one could reflect upon in the current situation is initiatives, for instance, from the Gulbenkian Commission, um, Foundation, but also bodies such as the, our own Bank of Sweden, Tercentenary Foundation, or the largest Wallenberg Foundations, or the large European Foundations, where they could have a review and re in a sense, take up the themes of Open the Social Sciences again, where you would have in promote institutional activities that transcended the still deep knowledge divides that persist, and maybe even create a space where you would have a kind of miniature version of the European Research Council, and where you also would try to rethink in a very critical mode, the role of contemporary universities. Because we all cherish and we all deplore some of these developments going on. But somehow, we are not able to bring ourselves to really believe that you could have autonomous research that was societally engaged and of a high quality. And I think it is absolutely possible. But we are somehow caught in our own in conceptual pessimism. And we must break out of that. Thank you so much. Many thanks, Bjorn. You've covered a lot of ground, and you said you were willing to take a few questions. I know it's late, but I'll keep the floor open for a few minutes to see whether there are people who would like to pose a question. Please raise your hand. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it a lot. And I have a question that is a bit uh, uncomfortable. It's, I know that we need words in order to make explanations, but I feel a bit unquiet with ex an expression that used a lot, that is global south. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I wonder whether it's not uh, a metonymic expression for third world or develop, developing world, and and then we social scientists contributing uh, a bit in a kind of innocent, innocent way to 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 keep these boundaries that uh, we want to overcome. I agree 100% with that position. I mean, it, it, I think it has, is, has been useful, at least for a long time, because it does designate real phenomena. Mm. But I think the scholarly interaction cannot be, cannot be maintained in terms where some people say, we are advanced and we come from this part and you are from the... I mean, the, when we work, for instance, with the, in this uh, pro, summer program in social sciences, of course, it becomes immediately impossible to think in those terms. And when you interact closely with scholars from Africa or from India, it becomes ridiculous if you just assign them to a specific category. Of course, you should have the most open, the closest scholarly collaboration. And I think we underestimate the force of human curiosity. <laughs> and that curiosity and enthusiasm will carry you across those divides. But there are divides, of course. It would be completely naive to deny that in institutional and resource terms, and we should overcome them. But I'm not, I, there are such di divides. But of course, this should not impinge on the way in which we interact with other scholars. We, had, we must maintain the illusion, not only the illusion, but create as a provisional utopia, the re a re kind of virtual reality of universal scholarly community. Of course we must be committed to that. I mean one of the one of the errors of a previous era is that so much inter international interaction was based on a 19th century model of academic diplomacy. I mean we now have unfortunately well 30 years ago if we, I edited the book 30 30 years ago Roddy Geiger the le one of the leading um, scholars on the American University wrote about ranking systems and we thought, well, these Americans are forced because of the, the, the very extent of their system to keep doing this. But we all realized, we thought, how much energy is wasted in the process. Now, of course, we have university presidents sitting in every European university calculating how they can rise in, in, in the ranking list. And there is actually deep-seated antinomy concerning institutes for advanced study because 30 years ago, there were a handful of such institutes. Now, not least in the wake of the Excellence Initiative in Germany and corresponding things in France, you cannot go to university without them having that. And I think that is good. But of course, the reason why they have been created is precisely because for, there is, and, and of course, they should embody a non-instrumentalistic view of what scholarly interaction is all about. But they have been created for instrumental purposes often, purposes to promote the prestige and the advancement of the university. And if I say that, some years ago we had a conference in the European, which took place in the European Parliament on the social sciences, a huge conference. And before that I calculated and I came to the conclusion that if, if the European Union set aside something like one and a half percent of the resources it has devoting to R&D to create, say, 15 or 20 really well-funded institutes for advanced study, at least as well-founded as the smaller American universe, such as the Stanford Center, the Palo Alto Center, that would be entirely possible. That's one and a half percent, and we shouldn't talk in, in light-hearted terms about money or resources, but it would be entirely possible. And in, in, instead, and since the, uh, the uh, mid-1980s, when our own institute was created, there have been a vast number of institutions. There are a couple of hundred at least on the global scale. And in Europe we created 12 years ago the, net, the European network, which again is French-based now, and which I've been active in very much all the time. But I mean, if you look at these European institutes, virtually every one of them, with the possible exception of the Wissenschaftskolleg, are dramatically underfunded. And they are subject, uh, and they, I mean, this, is, this development is good, but it demands, demands that scholars in these places strongly uphold the scholarly uh, autonomy and withstand this sort of instrumentalistic use of them. Thank you. Another question? We're all tired at the end of a long day. I but <laughs> Um, uh, sorry, this one over here. Could you just take the micro? 
it's not to take uh, time for question, but it's just a footnote to to, uh, uh, to what you mentioned regarding the PPBS and mm -hmm. the discover or the its mm -hmm. invention at RAND and mm -hmm. its transfer uh, mm -hmm. transfer to U.S. government. There is literature on that, and then we'll be happy to provide you with some references. Mm. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've written myself some more, but, uh, but I mean, of course there is. There is a lot of literature. And, and of course, this impinged very much on, on science policies internationally. I mean, you have some years later the Science Growth and Society, and then you have a rather fundamental shift in the science policy doctrine of most OECD countries. Uh, Olivia. Thank you. Uh, Bjorn, I wanted to pick up on a comment that you made mm -hmm. about the expression of the social sciences and the, as the humanity and the humanities. Mm -hmm. And I believe what you meant was that it was a, a positive trend that was putting these together yes. as opposed to in competition. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, now, if I can bring you to the uh, much more dry uh, discussion about European funding for research mm -hmm. and that the, the way the category is used uh, and the fact that more or less from the evaluation that is coming up now for the last, for 2015, mm -hmm. the SSH mm -hmm. uh, group has received a not remarkably uh, significant amount of funding. Um, so uh, let's say it is perhaps we could say somewhat struggling to, to receive mm -hmm. um, the resources it might merit. And the question therefore is, is the use of this collapsed grouping into SSH, do you think it might actually be negative as well as the positive side that you have highlighted? Mm -hmm. But in this much more managerial, let's say, mm -hmm. practical terms, is it a, a service or a disservice? And I wonder whether the question makes sense and whether you have any thoughts on that. Uh, well, I mean, I've... Uh, I've been on panels of the ERC and I was vice chair of the largest panel for consolidators. But what you are talking about is, of course, Horizon 20 and all the rest. And I've been in, earlier, I've been also directing uh, normal pr framework programs uh, on international, transnational collaboration in, in the social and human sciences between China, the former Soviet Union, and, and Europe. But, uh, and I was also very much involved when, uh, the for the first time, the social science and humanities was made the, op the theme of it, the opening um, uh, event of an uh, EU presidency that was in Vilnius. And for one year, we were a group of people. Helga Novotny was the key person, with Michel Vibjorka, Craig Calhoun, Ritva Feltai, and I was also in that group. And we were 16 people who drafted the uh, Vilnius Declaration, which spells out rather, rather in rather plain language, the need for increased support for the social science humanities. Um, it's, not a, it's not quite as brief in this record. Well, well it's, it's one page, basically, uh, which makes these demands. And during that, were, were you there in Vilnius then? No, I leave your dissertation. Okay, but it was very ironic because you had the commissioners and the whole commission and the, the, the country's leading politicians, of course, and the social scientists in managed filled this huge arena, and they were very, very happy when they were told that you are so important that you will be integrated in every specific theme. And of course, careful persons such as Olivier Bouin and others have calculated that it's a pittance that it will receive at best, and a very marginal one at that. Uh, whether the designation SSH has contributed to this or not, I cannot simply not judge. But I'm sure the, the, the risk which you highlight is a real one. But I think we will not be saved by terminology just. Thank you. There's a, another. <laughs> Would you like to take the floor? A question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm a bit of an ignoramus in this whole area, I have to say, um, so I may have a very stupid question, but I hear a lot in the media about uh, the post-truth society that we are um, heading for, living in, I don't know, 
And I was I sort of came into this talk wondering or perhaps even expecting you to talk about that and what the role and the position of social sciences would be in that. So I'm just curious whether you have any thoughts on that. Um, I'm, I'm also just wondering whether that, bringing it back to the sort of pragmatism of this conference and European research programs and funding, whether there are opportunities there for the social sciences uh, to to have a um, you know a, a major initiative, a flagship almost in trying to address some of those questions. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the the naive questions are always the most dangerous. But I'm I'm unfortunately I've been. Uh, I'm, I'm perhaps ignorant in other matters very much. Uh, so, of course, I come across this term post-truth society. And, uh, and of course, it's deeply worrying. Uh, if, uh, I mean, if, if, um, if the social sciences have nothing to say, that they, if they are not willing to advance any claims to knowledge, uh, what is the point of funding them at all in the first place? So even if we are conscious of all the societal and other social constructions that impinge upon our activities, and we should, we must, of course, be prepared to advance knowledge claims. Otherwise, I, I think we are in an impossible, in an impossible situation. And the post-truth society, is, as far as I can understand, is a name for a society when prominent politicians can construct whatever the reality they can, they want. But, of course, they cannot in the long run. Uh, some other realities will hit back sooner or later. But, of course, this is not the first time in history when we have a situation when the powers that be say that we are not interested in what you say. This has been a very, very familiar situation. And when the social science, what became the social sciences, were gradually and with great resistance establishing themselves in some European countries in the late uh, 19th and 20th century. That was the situation that obtained in many countries. I mean, Durkheim, Weber, these were people who could promote, they were, they were theoreticians, they had programs, so they were, were doing something different from just writing in newspapers generally. But of course they, had, they were also entrepreneurs who under some propitious conditions were able to institute some 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 professorships. We think we talk about sociology in France, but I mean there were half a dozen chairs in France, in all of France before the First World War. We talk about how wonderful Vienna was as a in Emmanuel, I have Austrian colleagues here who will <laughs> no more, but I mean, we should not forget that a number of the people which we associate with the Austrian school had terrible difficulties getting chairs in the Austrian environment. And we should not forget that in the 30s, one of the leading Austrian economists who was translated into many languages was Ottmar Spahn, who <laughs> was said that the happiest day of his life was when the Anschluss occurred. <laughs> He he was he had problems with that also actually, but so we should and of course there have often been settings when the powers that be believe they know what should be done and they don't need advice for any uh, ill-meaning outsiders who claim knowledge. So that's not that's not nothing new with that I think, but I mean I think we must we must with great persistence and energy. And, and, and openness and truthfulness also about our limitations. That was actually one of the mistakes that were made by many social scientists in the 60s. They promised that they could solve any problem if they were just showered with money, and they couldn't. And then you had this discussion of implementation gaps and lacking knowledge utilization. And so, but we, we should never promise more than we can, say, than we can hold. Thank you. Um, no. Did you, yeah. I think, I think time's up. Uh, yeah. And I would like Okay, those of you that uh, registered for the group.
group dinner tonight. It's at the rest. We have sent you some information. I think you have received it. If you, if, if you don't have it, ask me, please. And uh, the best way to, it's Restaurante Sagrada Familia. Okay, so you must have a, a sleep saying dinner, okay, to, to go there and uh, have dinner. And uh, it, it's, uh, you can, you can go by subway, and uh, as you leave the, as you leave uh, Gulbenkian, you can turn the, the main entrance, you turn left and left again, and there is a subway station called São Sebastião. I can write it down, those of you that need it. And uh, you can go up to uh, Santa Apollonia. I can also write, it's not easy, okay? So I can, I can write to some of you. Huh? Yeah, but that you just it's see it. Yeah, it's blue, 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 blue line. Blue line. <laughs> Some information on this with the. Uh, yes, okay, we, and you can go and check it. Yes, yes, but uh, okay. Those of you who need an extra help will be at the, at the desk, and you can ask us. Okay, thank you. Uh, 7.30, this was...